So, firstly, a quick question. How many of you were here at last year's Startup HPC? Yep, okay, that's what I was thinking. I recognize a lot of you, and I know some of you from other places. Um, one more thing I'll say um, about myself. Steve mentioned that I came from the University of Bath, so you can tell that I don't come from India. I come from a, a different part of the English-speaking world. Um, but if you like, my first contact with any sort of concept of a startup, after I left university, um, I became a high school teacher. I was teaching math for the 11 to 18 year olds from the all ability ranges up to pre-university. So one of those people that a long time ago helped to put the M in STEM. Then I realized after a few years, I spent seven years doing that, that after about three years I realized I was going to go nuts if I tried to spend my life doing that. So what I got interested in was the microcomputers that were coming out. So in 1980, I persuaded my high school to buy a bunch of Commodore pets, and I set up a computing department. And then I used that as an escape mechanism to get out. I spent about a year advising the local schools on how to use computers in schools as part of an initiative when they were pushing that stuff out. And then I basically walked away, joined Tektronix as a, a rookie salesperson doing high-end computer graphics. Tektronix lost the plot, so I joined DEC with the Unix workstations when they took the MIPS stuff on board, which was like a startup inside of DEC, and a lot of antibodies from the Vax VMS people against Unix. Sun was our sort of biggest competition, along with SGI and the new risk processors coming out of IBM, etc. I moved to the US in 91 with DEC, then doing sort of sales training and software marketing and such like. DEC lost the plot, I quit there in 2005, and sort of Steve has told you about the rest of that story. So here I am. So, how many people remember Adrian Cockcroft from Battery Ventures talk last year? If you haven't seen it, it's on the Startup HPC website. It's well worth looking at. A very, lot of really good information about you know, how to work with VCs, the guidance for people who are going to go forwards. And one of the things that uh, Adrian mentioned, which really sort of stuck out in my mind, was at Battery Ventures, they talk to about 5,000 individual companies a year. Out of that, there's maybe two to three hundred that they consider to be a hot deal where it's worth going ahead and going beyond the initial chat and maybe doing some research and seeing if they even want to invest. And then, out of that, they'll maybe pick 20 to 30, so 10 percent of those. So that comes down to, if you're going out to pitch to a VC, at least a battery, 0.5 percent of people actually get funded, which is quite scary in many ways. So it shows how hard the road is ahead. So I've, I've picked out a few of Adrian's slides just to pick on some things. I'm going to start off by looking at the HPC um, opportunity. Now last year's theme at SC was HPC Matters, which I think most people in this room would believe it does. However, it's a very defensive sort of posture because most of the rest of the world doesn't care. You know, they still think of propeller heads and people doing stupid things in academia. It's the brains and no money brigade. And most people don't understand it, so that's a problem. This year, we've got HPC transforms. And there are some similar questions. So if HPC really does matter, who does it matter to? It matters to us. It matters to the government. But beyond that, it even matters to business, except most of them don't understand HPC. So they use different language. They might be using it, but they don't call it that. I like HPC transforms because it poses a question. It's active, but it says, well, you know, what does it transform? Does it transform itself? Does it transform the rest of the world? Does it transform business? Good questions, which, of course, we can come up with answers to. And then, how does it do that? Well, that's what startups and other people are about. And then, for whom? Is it just for the HPC community? Is it for the benefit of mankind? Or is it to actually allow businesses to transform, to allow new things? So the economy, all of those other sorts of things. And then you've got, of course, new architectures coming. We know that, you know, we talk about the road to exascale. Well, I've just written up a blog for uh, Rich on Inside HPC about the latest top 500 list, which is now published. And uh, I think my title was exascale, oh no, it's benchmark schmenchmarks. And then, <laughs> but one of the comments was, I have seen the future and it isn't exascale. You know, we're going to get there. And in fact, the people who are going to get there first are most likely to be China. And it ain't going to happen probably until somewhere between 23 and 2025. 
So if we're looking at doing all of this stuff, which is very important, what are we going to do in the meantime, and what else does it take to get there? But new architectures, definitely. We've got a lot of that stuff coming. Cloud is definitely going to play a role. Now, this does not mean we're going to be running everything on Amazon. But cloud is a, an abstract service model, where it's on, whether it's on bare metal, whether it's on you know, heavy-duty, big iron, HPC-class stuff, you can still deliver things as a cloud. Most HPC facilities are sort of like a cloud without the abstraction layer anyway. They've got all the flexible pools of resources. So all you've got to do is present it in a different way. But it's definitely going to change things. There are going to be a whole bunch of new markets that come out where we can take the technologies that we do today into new areas because of some of the other things that are happening. You know, if we've got a whole bunch of sensors bobbing up and down in the ocean collecting data, we can really start understanding something about climate change. And then what does that allow you to do? And of course, we've got the convergence of HPC and the enterprise, because you talk about big data, well, what does HPC do? Lots of big data. What does HPC do? Modeling, analytics. But you then apply that to business problems, you apply it to businesses, and you help them become more efficient. And it's the same techniques, but once again, um, I wrote something a few years ago for ISC, and it was like, well, what do I say? It's like, okay, HPC by any other name would smell so sweet. And that's an area where I see a lot of people failing who've got great HPC expertise or a great startup, but they go and talk HPC language to business people. They don't learn that it's a different community, like learning to speak French or Chinese or something. You, you've got to have a different context, you've got to express it differently if you're going to get that attention. And of course, we've got global cooperation and global competition. And if you haven't seen the uh, top 500 results, you can go and get them from top 500, you can get them off Rich's site, inside HPC, it's all posted now. Basically, nothing much has changed in the top 10. You know, there's uh, two new machines, one eight petaflops, one five petaflops, but everything else is pretty much static. The top machine has been flat for about three years, because Intel was going to do an upgrade, and that got kiboshed by the US government. There's a little bit of change in the, below that, you know, we've now got, I think we're up to like 90 machines in a, of petascale capability, which is huge, because look at the science you can do. A couple of years, all the top 100 will be petascale. But we're not going to get to anywhere close to exascale. The closest machines we're going to have coming, there's a, probably a couple of hundred petaflop type machines, one, you know, 100 petaflops each from China, coming in next year or after, similar in the US. You know, we've got the Coral Initiative, a couple of IBMs, a crane machine, which are basically probably going to be around 100 to 150 petaflops, depending on how you want to measure it. So even if you add together all of the top 500, it's still only about 40% of an exaflop. So that's the sort of state we're in. It's not about measuring that. But if you start looking at the geopolitical stuff, that gets really interesting. The US has 40% of the machines in the top 500. China has come second. It's got 20%. And it's done that in a really short period of time. And one of the things that's important, if you remember the Council on Competitiveness, and that to outcompute is to outcompete, well, there's another phrase we could use today. If we don't invest, we're going to get beat. And we're not investing. We've got the smallest number of machines on the top 500 since we've had since 1993 when it started. It's a couple of hundred. It's pretty scary. We're not investing in our future. Hot markets. What is going on? Once again, Adrian's take on stuff, you know, commodity replaces custom hardware, infrastructure as a service data center, SaaS replaces packaged software, mobile replaces desktop, and flash replaces disks. All of these things and more are going to happen in the next sort of five years. And they're going to re-architect the way we do a lot of computing, not just in HPC, but also in business. It might start faster in HPC and then trickle down. But we've also, where's the investment coming from today? It's not IBM so much, it's Google, it's Facebook. It's you know, all of these different companies that are doing the blue sky research. You know, we had a Google car in Mountain View that got pulled over for driving too slowly the other day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so there's all this stuff going on, which is really important. But we're going through the biggest industry transition we've been through since the introduction of the IBM PC, 1981. That changed everything. And pretty much everything's been iterative since then. Although it was interesting, um, I was at the IBM thing last night, and they were talking about the three, they've got a, their now marketing thing is about the three eras of computing. And they had the, the calculator age, the programming age, and now they've got the cognitive era. Um, talk a little bit more about that later. But I was quite impressed to have here IBM talking about mainframes and calling them calculators. <laughs> the old rules are gone. 
All the old rules are gone. You know, we used to talk about HPC as the brains and no money brigade, that you can't make money with HPC. I looked at what's been happening, and I mapped out just the standard indices since about the mid-2000s. Intel's performance, IBM's performance, etc. HP's performance on the stock market. There was one company that beat them solid, Cray. Pete Angaro has done an amazing job in growing Cray, and although the stock, of course, is lumpy and it's volatile, it's much better investment over that period of time than any of the other guys. So, all, I mean, who would have thought that Dell would be buying EMC? Who would think that IBM practically has no machines left anymore? They would, last quarter, they were under a billion dollars for hardware. You know, we've got two companies just being formed, Hewitt and Packlet. And, <laughs> and they've still got an awful lot of stuff to work out. So all of that change is happening. Everybody's in turmoil. Intel is in trouble. Virtualization, you know, they <coughs> own the uh, enterprise server market. They've got about 90% of the HPC CPUs. And yet, if you look at the enterprise business, you know, with the industry standard server thing, you know, they own that. Virtualization, though, has caused them a lot of trouble because all the servers are two socket servers. Every year, Intel has to produce, at about the same cost, faster processors, more cores. People are getting better at being more efficient. And then the more you go to hyperscale and the cloud providers, they get even more efficient. So Intel is selling less servers, and that market is shrinking. And they own it, but it's not enough to save them. And they haven't got there with mobile yet. They're struggling to sort of work out what they can do in wearables. So Intel is really trying to have to sort of reinvent itself. And although um, you know, it's probably going to do it, because it's starting from a high end, this is a time when giants fall. But it gives the opportunity for startups to emerge. And that's really what we've got in the next five years. And although there will be unicorns around, these mythical you know, $1 billion startups, that's probably not going to stay around too much longer either. So it's going to be more normal business, I think. And if you're a startup, you probably don't want to go into a market that already exists. You've somehow got to put a stake out in the ground and say, what's going to be happening in 2020 or in 2025? So that's really my sort of, you know, you've got to be able to work out where the market <coughs> pump will be and then work out how to get there. And so those are all of the sort of things that need to be done. So this is back to IBM and the cognitive era, but I think it's true for everything else. Internet of Things, that is going to be huge. Because it's going to be vast. There are going to be sensors of all types everywhere. We've got to capture that data. We've got to work out, can we even transmit it? Or do we have to process it out on the edge? Then what do we do with it? How do we, do we store it? Or do we filter it and get rid of some? How do we analyze it? How do we present it to people? What do we use it for? So that's going to be a huge opportunity for big companies and small companies. And nobody really knows how it's going to play out yet. So everybody's looking for a strategy. And that means for small companies, there's a good place to take a play in that. Deep learning. All of the stuff that Google is funding, everybody else. Now, it's probably not going to be a startup like D-Wave. You know, it's great to do quantum computing. That's not a hot market. That's a cold market. Very, very cold. Fascinating what they're doing, but that's really not where the future is going to be. That's an experimental tool. But all the GPU stuff that you may harness with those algorithms and then use commodity technology to do it, the deep learning that helps you get there is definitely a fascinating area that's going to have be, I think, one that's going to be available to companies large and small. You know, IBM is doing a lot with Watson, but they're going to need an ecosystem. They're going to need partners. Because they can do broad stuff, but can they do every niche market? Can they do every specialist area? So if you've got expertise in a special area, you may be able to latch onto what they're doing and build a business as a specialist area. Artificial intelligence, OK? That's another one that's coming along. It used to be sort of uh, science fiction. And then we thought it was going to happen in the 80s and 90s, and it didn't. But now we're actually getting to the point where it really can, and there's all sorts of interesting things happening. Robotics, same thing, drive, self-driving cars, all the other sorts of things. Automation, once again, automation can be good if it frees people up to do more worthwhile things, but clearly there's an awful lot of economic impact as well. But there are a lot of interesting things that can be done there. Of course, analytics, and of course that goes across all sorts of different industries. You know, think about climate change. We know it's coming, there might still be some deniers out there, but if you've got all the sensors and what do you can do, what can you do with monitoring that? You know, we've got flood warnings, predictive analytics, precision agriculture, all the sorts of things that you can do to take that data, take those analytics, and then look at the changes and see how you can either prevent disaster or get good economics out of it. So what are the key applications? Once again, you know, Adrian's advice, what's the pain point? 
got to be something you know about. So although this is sort of very related, you've got to have credible expertise. People have got to believe you and trust you if they're going to invest. You know, you've got to be credible. And I think it was said earlier, you've got to sound confident. You know, that's one of the uh, first tenets of being an industry analyst. Credible, defensible, and say it loudly and with confidence. You don't actually have to be right, but it has to be credible. People have to believe you, and you do need to defend it. You need a large addressable market. And it's got, by that, although, yes, you want a large market to go into, by addressable means you've got to be able to get there. And ideally, it shouldn't be a market that you have to create. It takes too long. It's too much work. But if you can take an existing market and then leverage something into it that makes it better, faster, cheaper, more valuable, then there's something you can do. And somebody else is doing the heavy lifting to drive that along. Whatever you do has got to be measurable and meaningful. It's, it, it's great to have you know, a, a cheaper mousetrap, but you've really got to have something that, A, really moves the needle. And then also, um, you've probably got to have a plague of mice as well. So you've really got to look at what is going to change people's lives. And it's got to be a complete solution, not necessarily from you, but pe customers don't buy partial solutions. If they buy a p component, they plug it into something that's already complete. So you've got to look at the whole chain. You can't just look at your own widget. And uh, as I said, it's got to be accessible. Human beings buy things, not machines. And technology moves really fast. The old Scott McNeely thing, technology has the shelf life of a banana. But people buy things at a human pace. Organization will change, which is often required, happens at a human play, uh, pace. We've been talking about cloud. Cloud is like a five to 10 year journey for most corporations. It takes at least two purchasing cycles for these things to work through, in my experience, which is five to seven years. So if you're doing a startup, you've got to be able to get out there and then survive successfully and make money over that five to 10 year period. And it's got to be low risk. People aren't going to take high risk investments. I, as an analyst, all people come along and say, I've got this great idea for a new hardware system and it's going to replace this. And it's like, good luck with that. Because it's too risky for people to take it on board because you will probably fail. Whereas if you can do something that maybe bolts onto the side so it doesn't stop the original thing working but makes the thing work 10 times faster as some kind of accelerator, so you eliminate the business risk but you get the value, then there's maybe a model. So, and it's got to be easy to consume. Key applications, where does that go? Well, oh, I'm not going to spend long on this, but there are all of these sort of things that are coming because of the technology changes that we're seeing. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity to have an idea and look at these areas and exploit them. Not necessarily inventing something wholly new, but playing in these worlds and coming up with something smart, something that moves the needle forwards as part of an ecosystem. And at the end of the day, it's all about people consuming it. So you want to look at the behavioral analysis and you want to look at in human interpretation. How do we communicate these things to people? It's no good having results if people can't understand them or relate to them. Market choices. So you've got to get out there and assess the opportunity. Are you going to be entrepreneurial heroes? Well, you've got to be brave if you're going to do a startup. You've sort of got to have that hero capability. But the trouble is you've also got to assess the market. And you've got to sort of work out, you know, what's the competitive market like? What are the risks? What are your chances? You know, are you going to succeed? And uh, are you being realistic? What are you facing out there? Kelly's heroes, right? It's great scene where they're playing off the Clint Eastwood Westerns and have three guys facing down a tank. But that's basically what you're going to be like, going up against an Intel or an IBM or whatever. And they will crush you if they don't like you. So be realistic. This is Adrian's again. You know, startups are like premature babies. So your startup is a baby. And it may take a village to help it to maturity. All the help you can get, whether it's incubators, whether it's partnerships, whether it's other people that can advise you, whether it's your mother-in-law, listen. And expect it to behave like a teenager at some point in time. Things are gonna get out of control. Once you grow to a certain point, you'll have all of these employees and they might not like what you're doing. They may not share the same vision. So you have to get used to the social change that happens. And you've got to make sure you're a good parent. You know, don't protect it too much. You've got to take the risks. You heard that from other people. You know, don't overanalyze. Get out there and do something and move. What was it Mark Zuckerberg said? Move fast and break things. And if you're not breaking things, you're not moving fast enough. So all of those things. And you've got to love your child. 
but you've also got to avoid unrealistic expectations. And it was also said, if somebody comes along and criticizes you and gives you hard advice, you know, your baby's ugly and you dress it funny, well, you A, need to listen, but also you may say, I'm sorry, I got the communication wrong. Who said my baby was human? So there's all sorts of ways of dealing, but you really need to accept the reality of where you are in the market. Core algorithms, well, if I knew what they were, I wouldn't be telling you. And so that's up to you guys, but I think they're going to be in these areas to do with the new architectures. How do you exploit all of these system on a chip, FPGAs, DSPs, GPUs that are coming along? They're going to change everything. It's all integrated. It's all going to be commodity and out there from standard suppliers. But if you can ride on the side of that and do something new instead of reinventing it, then that's going to be great. Silicon photonics, that changes a lot. You know, distance, speed, the way you build things. So even though you've got system architectures, you can maybe do a lot more because of that. It's better, it's faster, it's cheaper, it goes further. New consistent memory systems, that's going to be really interesting when we've got things like you know, the 3D cross point or the memristor or whatever else comes along. If all of your memory is persistent, if everything is solid state, well, you, you, it changes the way you write software. And it might enhance it because you don't need to think about partitioning things and passing it off, but also it might break it. If your software is written to assume it's dynamic and it goes away when the power goes away or whatever, that could cause problems. So there's a lot of opportunity in the software space. I think a lot of opportunity for accelerators that take existing architectures, existing systems, but do it faster without the risk. So it'll still work in the old way, but you bolt this thing on the side and suddenly it goes 10 times faster. So you get instant gratification. So I think really those are the areas where you'll find algorithms, but I think it's going to be in software, and it's probably going to be based on open source, whether it's Linux or OpenStack or the Google AI stuff that's just been put out into open source, and it's going to be designed for the cloud. You may not run it in something like Amazon, but you, you might even run it internally, but if you design for a cloud-based execution environment and a cloud-based delivery environment, you've got more opportunity because that's where the world is going. And also, I believe it's got to be edge to edge. It's great to come up with a device like an Internet of Things. This is the, uh, the basis watch that came from Intel. Intel paid 100 to 150 million for basis. And at IDF, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000 people at IDF, they sent one of these out to everybody. And so, A, they're probably dumping them because they list prices like 300 bucks. What does it cost them to build? Maybe 50, maybe 100. But that's a quarter of a million dollars at least that they've sent out to everybody there. Unfortunately, the device is quite nice, but the software behind it is, well, most people that I've spoken to have said, meh, you know, it's just not good enough yet. So even if you're looking at an edge device, you've got to make sure that you're tied through to the back end and the overall experience is good. And fin finally, people said that team is important. It is about the people. And so this is where I'm winding up. So this is STEM, right? We all believe in that. But where do you get the creativity from? So I'm all in favor of raising steam. Let's get the artists in there as well. So consider hiring some steampunks. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we also mentioned getting out there, doing it smart people. Love this quote from Joss Whedon. So you get the same smart people, but have the fun and then take the credit. <laughs>